We just sang about that in that song too, by the way. Uh, Hope, the ransomed shall return. Words in that reading were, say to those with an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come, save you. The vengeance of God on this earth is actually salvation for the people of God. Isaiah also wrote, waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Does that describe how life has been for you this year? Has it been a wilderness, craving a stream to flow again, water in the desert? Well, Christ accomplished this in his first coming as the Lamb of God, the Prince of Peace. Now, he will establish this firmly for our own eyes to see when he returns. The second coming is what that describes, and that has been our focus so far during this season of Advent. Lord God, open our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes to your will, your word, the world around us, and grant to me your Holy Spirit's grace uh, to proclaim this message and grant to us all your Holy Spirit's anointing to receive it as you would have us receive it. To the glory of your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so a good deal of us in the room are married or have been married. I want you to think back to your wedding day. What was it like? Anyone nervous leading up to the day? Oh, come on. No one, really? I know Karen was. <laughs> yeah, it was hectic. Well, it was hectic, Sharon. I'm thinking, like, I, I don't know. Maybe it's the, the finishness in me that we're meant to be a bit more stoic and whatever. So having to put on a smile for a whole day, my face ached by the end of the day. Absolutely ached from smiling so much. What are some other points that come to mind if you think back to that? <laughs> That's exactly right, isn't it, Di? Like for all the planning, all the preparation, the effort, the input that goes into it, then the day comes and goes, oh, where did that go? Yeah. Did you feel a bit like it went too fast? Yeah. 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 Think for. Karen, and for me, yeah, the day certainly went very quickly, but I think um, for all the stress and the planning leading up to it, I think we consoled ourselves with the thought that this is just one day. Then we got the rest of our lives, you know? So, yeah, varied experiences, varied experiences, but I'd like to think it, it would have been one of the most special days of your lives. Now, I want to tell you about an Israelite wedding. On the wedding day, the bridegroom would dress in wedding clothes and his friends would escort him to the house of the bride. It was a communal thing, right? His friends would escort him to the house of the bride. Then the bride would come out to meet them with her friends. We've got a couple groups here. And in fact, when you read the Old Testament book, Song of Songs, a lot of it describes this very thing, this Israelite tradition and this procession taking place. And then, in fact, uh, in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, Jesus tells this parable, this story. Um, it's sometimes called the parable of the ten virgins, um, story about the bride's attendant, or the bride herself, being ready for the bridegroom to arrive at an hour that they don't know. Uh, Jesus picks up on this Jewish or this Israelite wedding tradition when he tells that parable, asking his bride, i.e. that's you and me, the church, 
to be ready for his return. And that's kind of how it was in the Jewish custom because when a couple became betrothed, and that, by the way, we might call something similar engagement today, but a Jewish betrothal was actually more serious, more legally binding than an engagement is for us today. It was as good as being married already, but it was a period of waiting or being prepared. And um, what happened um, at the betrothal was then the, the groom-to-be went away, often to his father's house, to build an extension onto the house, which would serve as the living quarters for the married couple. How long would that take? Well, however long it took to build the extension, and when would the groom return for the bride? Well, it sort of depended. Does any of this sound similar to Jesus' words in John? Jesus used the Israelite wedding custom to describe his relationship to the church, to you, to me, where he says in John 14, in my father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. You see, the Christian life, is like a betrothal. The church, the bride of Christ, is betrothed to Jesus, the groom. Heaven will be like the wedding itself. In the Israelite marriage custom, when the bride, groom, and his friends went to the bride and she and her friends came out, the whole group then would joyously parade to the home that the groom had prepared. Does this sort of act as a bit of a key that opens up a bit more depth to some of the gospel and some of the things that Jesus says? I find it absolutely remarkable. I'm not going to unpack it so much today, but also in the, the Israelite uh, wedding custom, there was a common cup of wine, um, and it would probably be a good message at Easter time. There's remarkable parallels between Jesus' last supper with his disciples in the Passover meal and the Jewish marriage feast. And then the final cup, um, often there were um, betrothals that took place at Passover. And so that final cup wouldn't be drunk there. It'll be left until the marriage feast itself and the bride, the groom and their parties came together and they both drank from the common cup to signify their unification. Does that sound anything like Passover and Holy Communion and Jesus saying that I will not drink from this cup again till the kingdom of God comes? I mean, the parallels are absolutely astonishing. Now, I've told you about the Jewish wedding custom. Now I want to tell you about a, a fiancé. Is there ever a fiancé who had been smitten by the love of her life? She found him to be honourable a man of integrity, worthy of her full trust and attractive in his own ways to her soul's deepest hopes, found that in him was a place of safety, her, her heart's deepest fears were okay. And she just totally can't help but laugh every time at his witty jokes and his gorgeous and quirky ways. Is there ever a fiancé like that who then turns to him as said, I don't want to know about the wedding, I'm too scared. Seriously, really? Most brides to be take great enjoyment and sometimes frustration and stress in planning the special day. Surely there's excitement about that. No one would say, I don't want to know about the wedding day, I'm too scared. Uh, this scenario would never happen, except that it does in the church all the time. Here's what I mean. There's many in the church today who won't ever 
read the book of Revelation because they're afraid of its content or they find it too difficult to fathom. Revelation, freaky stuff there, best leave that to the professional. Who are the professionals? Well, theologians in their ivory towers who pontificate and publish stuff. Pastors who are meant to know this stuff back to front. Maybe prophecy teachers who make a living just going around conferences preaching this stuff. Leave it to the professionals. But the problem is the professionals aren't reading it either. Revelation is a book that makes plain God's plan for the return of his son, the bridegroom, who returns for his church, the bride. And this remarkable book starts with seven letters that Jesus Christ himself dictates personally to the ageing Apostle John um, decades after Christ's resurrection. He comes back and appears to John personally, dictates word for word seven letters to seven churches. We find them in the first few chapters of Revelation. And then the rest of the book is John describing the visions that accompany that, the things that were revealed about what was to come, things that describe what is to come. This happened while John, the ageing apostle, was in exile on the island of Patmos after being the local pastor in Ephesus, decades after the time of Christ and Paul had written some of his letters that were in circulation already. Peter had done the same, maybe Jude. Those letters were shared. Gospel account of Luke, Matthew, John's own gospel, these writings, which now form a good deal of the New Testament, would have been used in addition to the Hebrew Scriptures, what we have as the Old Testament, in the local church fellowships for years, until John was exiled to Patmos and it was the day of the Lord, he said. In other words, a Sunday. And even though he was in exile, that didn't stop him from joining the rest of the church around the world from worshipping their saviour. He was in the Lord, in the spirit on the day of the Lord, when Christ appeared to him. He was the only one in his congregation. He was in exile. But Jesus dictated seven letters to seven churches and then gave him vision. That's what we have today in the book of Revelation. Now, what's more, Jesus guarantees his blessing on those who study this book. Revelation 1 verse 3, John writes, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. But the fiancé is fearful of the return of the bridegroom to get his bride and go to their wedding together. You see, despite its daunting reputation, this lengthy letter is a message of hope. It's a message of promise. Just like today's first Bible reading, Isaiah 35, which too is a message of hope. The ransomed shall return. Isaiah, he says these words, say to those with an anxious heart, be strong. Fear not, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Waters break forth in the wilderness and, and streams in the desert. As I round out this message, let, let's talk about aligning our perspective a bit. We've been in the end times. If you want to be technical, we've been in the end times for 2,000 years, ever since Christ ascended. But it does seem we're getting, if we go by some of the signs of the times, which we started looking at um, a few, uh, two, uh, in 
first Sunday of Advent two weeks ago. Um, we looked at some of the signs in a sort of a cursory way, the signs of the times. And then last week we took a bit of a deep dive on a case study, looking at, well, how do we handle one claim that's viral at the moment, that there's a very clear end time sign happening uh, in the Middle East? How do we evaluate that? We had a bit of a practical exercise last week in handling that uh, as an example of, well, how do we live in preparedness for Christ? Well, we don't know when he's coming back, but we're called to be ready. Uh, some of the signs that uh, people would put, uh, and we just touched on some of these for us to sort of evaluate um, with a mature faith. Um, one was the rebirth of Israel as a Jewish-led state, 1948. Um, the re-emergence of Jerusalem as the centre of conflict in the world. Uh, there's plenty of Old Testament prophecy, it would appear, that points to that. Um, other signs that sometimes might be used, uh, just the, the state of decline of morals and ethics in society today, and moral um, depravity, uh, just increasing levels of sexual perversion in accepted culture, massive increase in technology and knowledge, uh, the ability, this is going back to Cold War days already, the ability to self-destruct the planet, these nuclear fears, um, Technology leading toward maybe a digital currency, anything that points toward a one world convergence of things uh, is sometimes taken as a bit of a sign to watch for. Um, also, though, technology to complete the Great Commission. Jesus says the gospel will be preached to all peoples and then, in the same sentence, and then the end will come. So, in as much as there are still people groups who are unreached, with the gospel of Jesus, the end won't come. Well, that gap's being closed more and more with technology. And yet there's also technology emerging that has the potential to corrupt all flesh if we start talking transhumanism, um, connecting the human mind even to a computer to be controlled somehow. This stuff is science fiction nonsense, we would think, except when billionaires start actually researching this stuff and investing in possibilities. All I'm saying is there are those who would use some of the stuff going on around us to say that surely signs are starting to line up more and more that actually some of the things described by Jesus in Matthew 24, Luke 21 and Mark 17, a revelation might start to be fulfilled. Well, that might be the case. But let's align our perspective, okay, as I've drawn a survey of our last couple of weeks into this closing point here, and then Zach is going to bring us the message next Sunday uh, on one of the Psalms, which uh, is the message of hope. And I, I want to wrap this series up in hope as well, okay? So we've been in the end time since AD 30. But it is a story of hope. There's no need to fear the return of the bridegroom. You want to look more about the story of hope? You open up Revelation. There is no fear for the bride of Christ in reading what is promised. Imagine if we focused on preparing for Jesus Christ rather than being fearful, looking for who's going to be the Antichrist. Imagine if we focused on the mark of the lamb that we're baptised into the kingdom of God rather than being paranoid over the mark of the beast. Imagine if we focused on hope rather than fear. What is it that we need to live life well and faithfully? We need confidence, the sort of confidence Moses had the confidence where he stood still and he saw with his own eyes the salvation of the Lord promised to his people whom he led out of captivity as they were about to cross the river Jordan into Canaan, the land promised to them. Confidence like Moses. But what about commitment, the sort of commitment that Joshua had when he made a stand when no one else would. He made a stand and said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
And how about discernment? Surely we need a good dose of discernment to have our spiritual eyes open to the world around us like Joseph. Like Joseph, to recognise what some mean for evil, God actually might mean for good. Joseph still kept his perspective. He'd been thrown into the bottom of the well, lifted out and he thought rescued, only to be sold as a slave, ended up in Egypt. Um, He did all right for a bit, but then was wrongfully accused and imprisoned and then promised to be given a fair go and release and that never happened. If anyone ever had reason to only dwell on the evil that had happened to them, it was Joseph, and yet he saw that God meant that for good. What about faith? We need faith like Peter to step out of the boat and attempt the impossible for Jesus, and fervency like Hannah, fervency like Hannah, to trust God, to pray in times of despair and joy. Obedience like Samuel to heed the calling of God. Compassion like Luke, Dr. Luke, Luke the Medico, to care for the physical and spiritual needs of others. Dr. Luke who wrote Gospel according to Luke and who also wrote the Book of Acts, one of the most complete two-volume accounts of Christ. We need vision like Nehemiah had vision, to persevere in what God called success, not what the world or we think success is, but to persevere in the things that God says is success. And of course, salvation, because through Jesus Christ, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, restoration and relationship with their creator. So in this moment, we are betrothed to Jesus. We're awaiting his return. And when he does, our party, joins his party, we go to the wedding procession together. He won't forget about us. He won't let his bride be dragged, trampled on, killed, not spiritually. We know life can be hard. We know that sometimes Christians are persecuted around the world. In fact, there's places where they're persecuted more often than not. We're very blessed in Australia, but Christ will return for his bride. And all that remains for us is to be ready. Every day, ready. Ready for his coming. Soon he'll come to meet his bride. Lord Jesus, thank you for your promises. Help us to be faithful to you every day. Grant us that power through your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Amen.